Okay, hello. Um, hello, everyone. How is the sound? I wonder. Please tell me in the comments if I if there's some something wrong with the sound. Oh, good. Uh, hi, Sandy. Uh, hello, Derek Newell. Leonardo. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Your favorite type of noodles, yes. Um, very good. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, telling me that. Okay, so I'll start. Um, so last week, the Nanjing Cup started, and it's the 23rd. So um, actually, I think it's the second one we've had this year. They finished uh, the 22nd earlier this year. And um, this is the third game of the tournament. So um, Japan lost the first game against um, Korea, and Korea lost to China, I believe. And uh, yes, and, and now it's so um, Japan has to win this game to sort of keep even with the two other teams. So just to, some background is that the Nanjing Cup is a team tournament with five players for Japan, China, and Korea. And so five players each. And they um, take turns. The players um, come one at a time. So in the first game, um, two countries choose a player. And no one really knows in advance who's going to be the player. And so the, the, um, the winner goes on to the second round. And so with each round, someone, one person will disappear. So one team will lose a player. And in the game, Kyokagen is a uh, player in Japan, affiliated with the Nihon Kin, the Japanese School Association. Um, he's from Taiwan, so he actually has a Chinese pronunciation to his name, um, which is something I can't really pronounce. It's Shu, uh, Shu Chiu Yang, or something like that. Um, but everyone calls him by his Japanese pronunciation of his name, because he is active in the Japanese um, go seen here. So he's, he, we call him Kyokagen here in Japan. And he's a 9 Dan pro, but um, you could say he's a 10 Dan pro because he's holding the 10 Dan, the Judan tournament right now. So that um, translates to be the 10 Dan tournament. But since it's a domestic title in these international tournaments, we don't usually count that in. Um, so we, that's why he's being called a 9 Dan here. And White is Li Weiqing from um, China. And he's a relatively young... Both of the players are in their lower 20s, but I think Li Weiqing is 21. And so he's uh, a, a very a fairly young player. And very recently he was... Um, last time I saw him, he was an 8 Don. So he's promoted fairly quickly. And um, he doesn't have a title. So I don't know exactly... Um, he must have done something right. <laughs> but... Um, I don't know exactly what he did. He is in the top 10 of the Chinese um, tournament win-loss rating. So he, he has a good win-loss win record. Um, I don't know exactly. Um, I saw a list of Chinese uh, title holders, and he wasn't in that list. So I don't think he's taken any Chinese titles. Um, probably just good all around in various tournaments, maybe. So um, so that's my introduction. Um, I don't really know a lot about Li Weijing. As I was saying, he's a relatively new face, and he moved up to Nine Dan very quickly. So let's um, move back to the beginning of the game. And this, this game, when it started, actually, um, if anyone looked at the thumbnail that I made for uh, to advertise this video, the live stream, um, you might have noticed that I was commentating on it. So I, I did a live commentary at the Nihon Kin, at the Go Association, um, while they broadcast this game. So uh, that's a picture of me doing the live broadcast um, at the Nihon Kin. You can see all the all the stuff behind me at the Nihon Kin and stuff like that. And so I decided I'd do this game. It's the game that uh, went well for Japan. And it started interesting because um, it's the Korean um, Go Association, uh, the Korean Go Association that was in control of setting up the game, and they made a mistake. Um, 
they made a mistake when setting up. And I think it was the time controls that were wrong or something. And they had to set up, I think it was three or four times. So the game was a bit delayed in starting. And at one point, I think uh, Kyokage and the Japanese player was going to be playing with white. But since they had to set up the whole system on the internet, uh, this play game was being, play being played remotely on the internet between um, Kyokage, who was in Japan, and uh, Li Weijing, who was in China. So th they had to reset the internet setup. And it turned out that Kyokagen had black the second time. The Komi is six and a half. Um, wow, people are talking about Dons. Um, in this case, uh, the, the Japanese Dons and the Chinese Dons, uh, they're considered to be equal. Although the Chinese players are doing better. The professional systems are very similar. They're a very similar structure. It's the same professional dance. Uh, talking about the strength of amateurs, the, it's it's hard to say. Um, because it depends where you're playing when you're an amateur, basically. And it, it changes a lot. Okay, back to the game. So they, they didn't start on time. And there was this confusion. Um, but it was caused by the Korean organizers, I suppose, a mistake they made. Um, and so you might think that the, uh, I don't know, um, there wasn't any um, big deal about it anyway. The players seemed to accept it. So we um, have this, this small knight's uh, corner enclosure in the upper right, uh, which is a bit unusual nowadays, but some players play it. And white plays the two-space extension. So this is a point where um, people used to play a three-space extension. And uh, our AIs do not like this move. I think the idea is that just it has that weakness at R7, which is not good. Um, the AIs will give you a fairly good score if you play on the fourth line like this, which is something I do a lot. Um, but it, they tend to like the two-space extension also. And so this is a position where I think it sort of depends on which AI you use, but the AI will give you a fairly good score if you play a two-space extension. And the idea is that um, if black kicks, then white can play another extension towards the side. Um, or if black plays a pincer, at some point, uh, white might do this immediately. White can play a slide towards the corner and have a living shape. And then black would have to do something towards the left, the lower side for that, um, that group on that side. So, so the two space extension works. I sort of advise people to use this because it's a move that's relatively easy to understand. So if you play the three space extension or even this one, you have to, you have to sort of research it and know how to deal with an in invasion. You have to know how to deal with moves like this or moves like this. Um, which can be annoying. So, so moves like sometimes moves like this, um, and it all changes if black plays a stone here next. So, there's more complications when you have the wide extensions. Um, if you're doing this for the first time, this is a move that's relatively easy to understand because the next move, if black plays from the side, white can play towards the corner or vice versa. Um, Q6 or 7. Oh, that's a pincer. Oh, at some point. Oh, quick. Yeah, Q6 or Q7 can be done. Yes. So white kicks here. This is another modern joseki, and black plays the extension. So this is something that happens a lot in this whole opening in professional games. So white plays the shimari to this way is sort of backwards. I think this is where Li Weiqing is um, already playing something a bit different, uh, where the normal move, the textbook move, you might say, would be to play on this side, um, making Miyai of the upper side and the lower side. So when white plays here, uh, sorry, that was the wrong one, this way, um, white is making Miyai or interchangeable points of the left side and the upper side, but the the I'm, the left side has become bigger. It's um, if white, if black plays away, 
Uh, actually, th this is a big move that black could have played, um, but this is also, uh, white has increased the value of this move at two. Okay. Um, so in the game, black extended here. So it's as if black had played an approach move to that corner and white immediately jumped in. So this is um, sort of interesting. White, white sort of waited for black to play that stone and then jumped in. Of course, if black had played a safer move, like for instance, this, then the whole area would have cooled down and white could play away. Uh, and you would see profess uh, you would see professionals or even AIs uh, play something like this. Maybe um, I saw a lot this move a lot coming up in the Katago analysis. Um, so it's still a popular move to play moves like this and, and this um, moves that we saw AlphaGo played when it was playing with the Elias uh, Master um, against top professional players. It, it played this move a number of times. Okay, so white invades. So this is starting the first fight. Um, I would have played, if I were black, I might have played the attachment towards the corner. Let's see if I made a variation. No, I didn't. Um, so so this one. Uh, this could have been played. I'm not sure how white would follow up, but if white plays... Let's see. Um, white could play various things. White could play this way and then down. Um, it would still be a fight uh, moving up, but black would be getting a bit more territory towards the corner. Um, so this is something black could have done. Nowadays, you see a lot of crazy variations with, with this Joseki. So you could see white playing stuff like, like this, or maybe this move. Um, and although they're both very popular moves, or even the double Hane, this is a move that has been around, has been popular um, for a longer period. This was played um, before we even had AIs. It was played several decades ago, actually. Um, but it was not considered, it wasn't such a popular move. It wasn't, people didn't like it as much. But this is a move that people have been playing for a long time. Some people have. Uh, moves like this and this are pretty new and they were sort of introduced to us by AIs who suggested these moves. So, uh, I guess he decided not to get into that one, and he just jumped out. Kind of an old-fashioned move, almost. And white jumps in the corner. Um, when black jumps to the fifth line here, jumping into the 3-3 three, three point next is going to be a strong move for black. Um, because when black plays here and, and white bumps against, which is kind of what white wants to do, black will be um, looking at the cut here, which can be a pretty strong attack. So... Uh, this is why white is answering, one of the reasons why white is answering in the corner immediately, because that invasion at the 3-3 three, three point, um, it's pretty strong. Okay, looks like we're getting some interesting questions here. Um, how do I think historical players would have reacted to the new AIs? That's Derek Neal. Um, and... Derek is mentioning Gosegen. Now, it's interesting because Gosegen actually um, so really liked to play the shoulder hit. So the move I'm talking about is, for instance, um, it would be played with this move, for instance. Uh, White could have played the shoulder hit. Um, he just loved to play the shoulder hit against the three, the, this uh, corner enclosure to the extent that he would, play, he would play White one even before Black had the stone here. In the hope, you might say he was playing it in the hope that Black would play at P17. So he would play a two-space Kakari, and he would be happy if Black played the, the P17 point, which was the most popular way to answer White's approach move. And so it was just a point that Gosegan loved to play. And then I was seeing AlphaGo play it as master, and I'm still seeing this move being very popular with AIs nowadays. Um, so there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of similarities in the ideas that Kosegan had that sort of are, are working to a certain extent with AIs. Then there's a lot of things that AIs do that um, he probably wouldn't like. Um, so I think the top players, historical players, would um, 
as the modern players are doing right now, I think they would um, be very interested and probably adapt to it. Um, people might have the impression that um, historical players just had these styles that were sort of static and didn't change so much. It's not true. They, there was a lot of innovation going on then also. So I think they would have welcomed uh, any kind of new ideas. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Black P17 after white O16. Yes. Is what Nick, uh, the armpit hit? Okay. <laughs> Um, so I think Paxson Yu was saying that he um, that he was taught not to play this move, but um, it's become very popular now. I, I can I can emphasize with that. Um, he'd probably be feeling more happy at playing the large knight's move, which is probably what um, he meant when he was saying the elephant step. Okay, let's get back to the game. Yeah, so white invade and black jumped out and white protected the corner. So this is an important move for white to play when black has uh, this jump here, which increases the value of a jump into the 3-3 point. And black is playing here. Black is trying to get a large-scale attack on, on white here. So uh, that's what he's doing with this move and the jump. And while this move is um, moving out towards the center and it's controlling, starting to hope to control the upper side also. So Black's trying to attack on a large scale. There is a problem that uh, the connection is not perfect. Uh, when White does, let's see if I've made the variation. Yeah, this one. When White does this, the connection is not going to be perfect. So, um, yeah, this kind of thing actually could have happened. And it would have been a fight like this. And... Um, so a big fight. In some cases, white's going to sacrifice the left side in order to get a, an advantage in the center of the board or hopefully on the upper side. Um, stuff like this could happen. It looks like it's about an even fight. Let's get rid of the volume for my uh, window here so you don't hear the stones. Okay. And instead, white jumped out. Um, and black played here. So this move, um, it seemed to reduce Black's score in most cases. So um, as far as I can tell, this was um, the AI didn't like this move and was suggesting Black should... And I, I was really interested in how this was working when Black does something like this. Um, although there was a lot, of, a lot of moves to choose from that were the score was pretty much the same. Um, the value of peeping at 1. And peeping at 1 and jumping at 3 is kind of a combination where... Black 3 is taking care of the weakness that the peep, the exchange of 1 and 2 is created. So for, basically, if black doesn't do that, then white will be able to create a better shape towards that side. So that exchange of 1 and 2 has strengthened white in that direction, making it easier for white to move towards um, the lower left area. And so 3 is sort of making up for that and making a good shape on both sides. What the peep at one is accomplishing here is that it's making a connected shape when white um, tries to make a, a wedge there. Black can play the hanging connection there. And everything is connected. Although there's a lot of peeps. Uh, people don't like all these peeps sometimes. But it's okay. It, it's a lot better than not being connected. So it's, it's a connected shape. And this would actually have been a fairly close fight. So black should have played this way. It's one of the better ways for black to play. And we're, the, the, the fact that black doesn't really have a good connection here when black plays here. Um, and there's weak, and white immediately actually extended, I think. Yeah. So, so the fact that blacks, the connection of black stones is not so good, it's going to mean that in some cases white's going to have moves like this or like this or like this um, weak points to, to look at later in the game. So it's a potential problem. And uh, the AIs did not like it. And white jumps in here, actually. This is, this is an exciting move. 
I, I think the idea is to for black to play something underneath and for for white to get some extra potential um for instance with something like this uh, white would be getting some extra potential on the left side so i think this is the idea that white had here um incidentally it's taking away some of black's eye space too so this would be white's idea and black is going to fight strongly here played two uh the combination here in the lower left corner is something you see black doing basically if white plays away Black has this forcing move here and can cover here to get um, get a good shape towards the lower side of the board. So black is threatening to do that. And the idea also is that since white is alive in the corner here from the start, the, the moment white played the kick and the jump, the original shape there, uh, the shape that white already has in this position, it's already a live shape. So it's okay for black to play this exchange and strengthen white a little bit. So black played this one forcing move and is going to continue by strongly fighting on the left side of the board. We're still talking about the elephant step. Mm-hmm. White B5. Um, black B5. Um, white B5 would capture the one black stone, but black's not worried about that. Um, it's not a big deal. So if white plays here, um, black just sacrifices the one stone. And locally, black could continue with this. Uh, looking at the overall position, um, stuff in the center of the board would probably be more important. Maybe a peep here. So white doesn't really, it's its just an end game move at this point. So white plays here. Um, and white is just trying to sort of use this stone um, as nuisance value. Um, since moving out, if white moved out, it would be pretty damaging to the other white stone. So if white had done something like uh, this, it looks like white's going to lose those stones on the left side, even if white can escape with this one stone. So stuff like this would probably be um, probably be a bad idea. White's not really gaining anything by escaping. Or if white tries to play even more strongly than that, you can see that that group on the left side, um, this group here, it's going to be swallowed up probably. So that's probably why white doesn't want to do this immediately. Um, so white's looking at that possibility and is going to try to use that the possibility of using that marked stone to get some extra moves towards the center of the stone, the, the board, I guess. And black's not allowing that. He actually played very strongly here. This was a point where he could have played uh, something like this to settle the left side. And white would probably just play the shape um, if white plays this way, black can fight like this. So white's probably going to play the shape move. Um, oh yeah, this one. The shape move. But this is okay for black too. So black could have taken the, the white stone on the left side there. And it would have been um, pretty much uh, an even game. Um, by the way, uh, Kyokagen, among Japanese players... He's probably one of the more um, fight-oriented players. He likes to fight a lot. And you can see he's he's um, very actively playing here, especially with the next move. I was, I was a bit surprised by this move. This was a point where Black could have played, um, for instance, Black could have cooled it down a little bit by um, playing this forcing move here. This is a forcing move. And then uh, just extending. And Black would be okay on the left side and would have good shape in the center. You can see white's pushing from behind, which means that black stone's extending out towards the center. They're going to dominate. They're going to dominate this whole area here. And so black has positive uh, value in that area and is going to be okay on this side. It doesn't seem to be anything wrong for black. Um, of course, the game is 
not bad for white on the whole. It's, it's a, at least an even game. But this would be a very natural way for black to play, which is probably what I would have chosen. The way he plays, um, he's asking for a fight when he plays here. He's just basically inviting white to cut. Um, and this cut at the head of two stones, you can see the two stones, the black stones on the left of that white cut. And there's only two black stones, which means that they're sort of short of liberties. Cutting here is supposed to be a very important um, vital point. So it's supposed to be really good. And he's playing well out. He's attacking White's group on the side. So this is where um, I was actually commentating on this live, and I really like this move. It looked really good and light. And the idea is that if Black plays here, then White has accomplished escaping towards the center uh, with the tempo. So White can then continue, probably this way, in the center of the board, continue fighting here. So White's just escaping, uh, basically, with these, these four stones are the important ones. So escaping out towards the corner here, sort of drawing a line there. Um, and eventually White's going to hope to put some treasure on those two black stones, these two black stones in the center here. So that's that's what White's plan is, sort of. The cut that White played at L10, 11 is, is really, it's a kind of a vital point move. Uh, not only is it Kiai, but it's it's really enticing for White to want to cut there. It's, uh, a lot of potential for counterattack. But again, instead of playing the, the calm move here, um, Kyokagen chose the more active move, which is really dangerous, but um, that's the way he plays. So he plays here and he jumps here. And um, this just seems so natural. This is the, the diagram that I made as I was watching the game. It just came automatically to me. Um, but I did see the computer showing this variation. So I'll show you a variation that I saw uh, White playing here. And this doesn't seem to be working. Um, but it looks like Kadabo just wants to sacrifice this white group. And it was, uh, the variation was something like this. And, um, sorry, black doesn't play that yet. And black has an eye on the left side, so black's going to win that fight on the left side. That whole white group is dead. So this is why it's sort of counterintuitive for humans. But white is getting a lot towards the lower left corner. So this would be about even, um, an even trade. In the game, um, you will see that white actually sacrificed these two stones, these two stones anyway. So white sacrificed about half of the group. The only added stones are these four or five stones that white has added to the sacrifice. And white did get this, this territory in return, which white did not get in the actual game. So um, when I look at it that way, it's sort of reasonable that um, that Kadabo would suggest this variation. But um, as I was saying, it's sort of counterintuitive to sacrifice the whole thing like that. When white has cut in the center here, um, you'd think that the whole thing, everything was uh, stones that you could not sacrifice after you've invested that move in, at the mark point. Um, but it's strangely working. So this is um, interesting. I sort of doubt that I would ever be able to play that in a game. I wouldn't. I just would not come up with it. It's just so natural to play here and get a connected shape. So this is actually the diagram that I was showing, assuming the players would play like this. And as I was saying um, during the game, I was um, doing this live at the Nihonkin, if black plays next, black's going to have a territory there on the left side. If white plays next, it's going to be a seki. So... Um, it was interesting that I um, sort of nailed it here. And they actually played out the Seki just as I did. Um, so Black could have played... Black could have played... Let's, let's do the variation. Black could have played here. And um, this would have been a good move that gets about 10 points there locally. And we'll capture those two white stones. So the, the fight would continue in the center of the board. This would have been okay for Black. Um, instead, black pushes through, uh, and black's going after uh, these two white stones. 
So taking a different group, these two white stones are important in that they connect black up to the group on the other side. So there's a positional advantage to capturing those two stones. They're not so important as far as territory is concerned because white can reduce the territory with this move. So it's, it's not such a, it's not as big as it looks as far as territory is, is concerned. And when white plays here, this is going to be a seki if white continues playing. Um, white doesn't actually have to continue playing. But if white continues, um, it's going to be a seki. Um, just this exchange here, um, the exchange up to this point, white has already gained a little bit um, with, the, with the stone here. So white's gained in the strength of the position on the outside. Locally, if white continues, uh, white would play down here. And let's just fill the liberties just to show you how it's supposed to turn out. So this would be a seki. And um, it's only 10 points of black territory that went away, disappeared. And if white captures that black group, it would only be 16 points. So at this stage of the game, although locally it's a seki, um, both players would play away if they're given a chance. Um, so actually, if white plays that move, it's already a seki as it stands. So black will just play away. And it's not really worth it yet. It's a, it's only a ten, uh, about 10 points. It's a bit more than 10 points, actually. Because when black plays there, when black plays here, um, black doesn't actually have to take those white stones off the board. So this would be more like 14, 15 points. Yeah, about 15 points. Uh, also, there's the fact that uh, black will now be able to save this stone. So it's actually bigger than 15 points. It's close to 20 points, maybe a bit um, early for black to play that. So white continues the fight. Um, if you seem to hear static behind me, um, I'll just let you know that it's raining here in Japan. So, so there is some rain um, that I hear. I'm sort of hoping that people won't hear it. Uh, it might be filtered out. And so it's a question of who's in trouble in the center of the board. So white has this weak group here. And black's group is not completely alive either. But black seems to be attacking in general. Uh, white does have, let's see, if we look at the territory, white does have more than 40 points. Like that, that territory in the upper right corner, upper left corner, that is, it's close to 20 points. And the territory in the lower left corner if white continues squeezing that black group while making the seki, that's going to be about 20 points also. White has some territory on the right side, so it's more than 40 points. Um, black has not really established too much territory. Black has that area on the left side of the board, which if black does continue surrounding it, it's going to be more than 20 points. Black has an upper right corner, and then the rest is undecided. So black, white does have a slight advantage in territory. Hmm. Yes. And yeah, people are hearing the, the rain. That's good. So yeah, white play the... This is just a shape move. Um, if black pushes... And white will probably jump. And you can see that the shoulder hit is sort of connecting up to white's group in the center to make a little space there for white. So that's the idea that white had. And... Um, Black didn't like that. So black is going to try to split the two groups. If we if we call this white stone a group here, by playing this this peep, it's usually bad form to play a peep where you could have cut. And it's, it's a kind of a vulgar, what people sometimes call a vulgar move. Um, but if white connects here and black jumps, you can see that uh, that group in the center of the board, um, it's getting cut off. And so this kind of fight... Um, for instance, stuff like this. Uh, black might actually save that stone in the corner. Uh, but this this kind of fight here, you can see that group in the center, it's getting isolated. So this is the general idea that black has when black plays that peak. Black's splitting the two groups. Black 09. Um, that's a good question. That's uh, Leonardo de Wagner. Um, that's a good question. It's a question that I had. 
Um, this move in itself is, it's a kind of a shape move where black is establishing a connection between the two black stones and black stone on the right. So if black doesn't play that, I think it's reasonable that black wants to play somewhere in that area because for instance, this would be a shape move, um, but white's gonna play something like this. And black's two stones in the center, they're gonna be cut off. And so that even if black plays something towards the side, uh, the same thing could happen. White could play here, cutting off those two stones in the center. And since black does want to try to attack white in the center of the board, those three white stones can come under attack. And black doesn't really uh, mind so much that white is getting this uh, forcing move here because black's group on the left, it's very strong. It's connected up to everything. So black doesn't have to worry about that group. That's one of the reasons that it's okay for black to allow white to play this forcing move here. So in order to um, attack white in the center, this seemed to be a very natural move to me. Um, that said, I think the computer um, analysis was suggesting that black play uh, play one line to to the to that side, um, so one line towards the center of the board. A very subtle difference, but um, when black plays here, um, in the future black will still have the option of covering here, which is the the next move that black wanted to play towards the right side anyway. So this is the move that black is aiming at. Black can aim at this move anyway, even if black has the stone one line to the side, one. So having seen this move, it makes a lot of sense. I, I agree with this. So I, this is a very natural way for white to play. And when black played here, white continued on the upper side. So white's going to sort of sacrifice this group in the center. It makes sense in a human way and it's working. The game actually at this point is still fairly even but um, white score was slightly better than blacks until black played here. Now this was clearly a mistake. Something on the lower side is looking, starting to look huge. That's a very good point. Uh, Derek Neal said that. Um, it's getting big, but the fight on the upper right, in the upper right area is still too important. So uh, that's the next thing that happens after the fight cools down a little bit. So to talk about what Black should have done is Black should have played here. And um, this kind of move is not, it's not really a problem. Black can just keep on answering it. So White's probably gonna play here. And this is gonna be a forcing move towards the corner. And then White has a choice of trying to connect up to the center or playing towards the upper side. They're, they're Mia, they're interchangeable points. So if White saves the center group, Black can play towards the side. And uh, in this case, this white stone here, it's captured. It's not going to be able to, to escape. So black is connected up to the left. And white's group is not alive yet. So black is going to continue to attack. Uh, white could continue with this. Um, black would probably play some... Black has to do something with the center group. The fight would continue. Uh, but white's group there on the upper side, it's not 100% alive yet. So black has a nice corner there and still some potential to attack. On the other hand, if white plays something towards the upper side, then black's going to get to play here anyway. And so it was better for black to make this good shape towards the upper, upper corner. And we're going to see white punishing black for that because when white uh, plays this sequence, black's corner is getting squeezed a little bit and white is getting a good shape on the side. So at this point, um, white was supposed to be winning and it's looking good for white. White just has, basically white has a territorial advantage. In this fight um, in the upper right area, uh, black did get two small territories. So it's this territory and this territory, um, but white already had some good territories in other parts of the board. Um, to start with, white did have a slight lead in territory, so that's going to be good enough for white. Okay, um, Paxson Yu is saying, if he were black, he would be looking at playing um, R9. Um, but actually, this move um, is going to be Miai with this move. 
And actually the corner is bigger in this case because when white plays two in the corner, it's going to put pressure on black's two stones on the outside. Black has to play here. So this is a sequence that black could have played. Uh, but since the, the right side there is not going to be a big black territory, um, it would be okay for black to play at three just to start with in this case. So, so it's the fact that the, the right side is not really that big an area. So I'd say that the game move where black played the clamp here first is probably better. And this is where white made a mistake uh, by connecting below. So this is um, something I found really exciting to see the variation shown by Katago. Um, this is very natural. This is, um, it looks like the better move because white, um, white has to make eye space for this group here. And so while white has the potential to extend towards the side here with a move like this, um, apart from that, white doesn't really have eyes. So when white plays at one, white is creating a potential eye at this point. And that's pretty significant. It also means that uh, white next, white's next move, um, playing a honey here, that's really great shape for white. So black is probably going to continue by playing down here. And the move that was beautiful was the following move, where white can play a peep here. So when white peeps here, when white peeps here, um, if black connects, then it's a it's a kind of a life and death thing. So so white will connect here, um, and black say black plays away. This is going to be some kind of a co in the corner. So for instance, if black plays a honey, and white plays here, this is actually sort of a cue. Uh, it's a clue for one of my um, next batch of my life and death problems because there's a similar shape that I do. This is going to be like a. Um, it's going to be like a maninko, or it's a it's a, an approach move code that's going to take a long time to re resolve, but it is like it's at the best it's going to be zero points for black, so it's actually a problem, right? So there's potential for white to kill this black group, and if white at some point, um, if if at some point white connects here, it's just going to be a, uh, it's going to be a seki, so it's going to be zero points, or actually one point for the one stone that white captured. And so that whole corner territory is gone with the danger of black getting killed in a co, of course. So that's what's happening with the peep here. Um, black can live by playing here. So the reason why it's playing this exchange right now is because this reduces the value of black cutting at S14. If black cuts at S14 at some later point in the game, uh, then white can squeeze from this time, this side. Uh, so this is a huge difference, and it's a four-point difference in Black's territory. Um, the four-point difference, if we compare to White not having played that peep, um, and Black getting the territory like this, uh, there's a four-point difference in the size of Black's territory. So that's a huge difference. It's, a, it's just um, like it's a almost a life-and-death matter when the players are top professionals. And so this is the move that I, I really enjoyed seeing when I was doing the computer analysis. So, so black's probably going to answer here, but then white can play away. And um, black will probably play away too. But the fact is that when white is connected at one, that white group is not going to have so much trouble making two eyes because uh, this, this connection at one is just, it's just good eye space. A thousand, uh, it's a 10,000 year code, uh, Gavin Rooney is saying. A 10,000 co, yes. Yeah. Um, why is he wearing a mask? I would just assume it's because uh, there were other people in the room or something. Um, but that was the Chinese player who's um, you see with the mask. So that's Li. And I wasn't... He was in China, so I don't, I don't really know firsthand. So connecting underneath and black jumping here, um, it's sort of visually obvious that this shape, uh, just with fact, the, the fact that black has that stone at a key point there, uh, makes a big difference in white's eye space. So in the game, white peeped now. Uh, white, uh, of course, if white had if white had peeped, 
now white, white is sort of um white doesn't have the option of sacrificing one stone on the side so black's going to play here anyway and it's not going to be very effective so white's idea with the attachment here was he was asking locally he's asking which side is black going to play is black going to play at r18 or t18 if black plays at r18 now is the time for white to play an atari attacking two stones and if and in order to force white to connect it q14 black has to save these two stones and because of that exchange in the corner uh white is threatening to connect so white is threatening to connect the one stone here which would cause trouble for black obviously in the corner um pretty obviously if white had just simply played the atari to start with um then black's going to answer like this. This is not even a, it's not even a seki. It's, it's going to be a lie. So this is going to be a black territory if black plays like this. Um, it's just, in actual play, black would probably even play away and allow the coat. It would be costing white too many moves. So this was a, a very, uh, you could say it was an exquisitely timed move because if black plays on this side, now white can extend and connect, and that uh, 10,000 year co in the corner, is, it's come back to life. Uh, but actually black could con could cut here, and it was wasn't working so well. So now black's alive in the corner, well, it's potentially a seki. Or, or that 10,000 year co, it's, it's not something that's going to happen immediately, so it's not a big deal maybe. And white has to live on the right side. And black got to attack white on the upper side. So this was a big chance for black, who is uh, the Japanese player Kyokage. Um, this was a big chance because if black had played here, um, this would have been very difficult for white. So one variation I was seeing was white playing the attachment here and pulling back and trying to make eyes like this, you can see it's sort of painful for white. Uh, this whole variation is a bit painful for white. Um, if black plays an Atari here, white's not going to be able to uh, connect the three stones. Um, and I think it's just painful for white. Otherwise, uh, there was the variation where maybe white was going to try to play this, um, and black will peep and pull back here. This is going to be a difficult fight for white also. Now, white doesn't really have a very strong position towards the left, so it's it's not really working for white. So this is how black should have played. Black should have strongly attacked with the pincer here. Uh, for some reason, he probably thought he was ahead, or maybe the fact that there was that co in the corner that was sort of pending uh, made him thought that this would be forcing. But when white skipped away like this and allowed black to cut, and then got the big point on the lower side that uh, Derek Neal was talking about earlier. Was it Derek Neal? Yeah. Um, this big point on the lower side, uh, White has taken an advantage now. So uh, White is expected to to win at this point. So Black kicks once. Um, important. Okay, White played once here. This is a big move. So this, this move here, um, as I was telling you, if at some point white plays down here, this is going to be a seki. And in the process of the seki, white's going to pick off this, this stone. It doesn't really matter here who plays first, but locally, um, locally the, the shape is going to be something like this, and it's a seki. You can see white is picking off uh, some points on the side here. So uh, Compared to the game, that's three, it's going to be three or four points difference here, locally. Uh, you can see that it has reinforced the white wall here by capturing the stone at three. Uh, that cutting point that I've just marked has gone away. So it's um, taking away some of black's territory, 15 points, and getting three extra points for white, so that's 18 points, plus the fact that that cutting point, which is going to affect how they fight on the lower side of the board, that's big too, so that's... Um, 18 points plus the cutting point, Aji. Uh, but this was, the game move was big too. 
Um, so that explains what Black is doing when Black plays this move, which is filling one of his own liberties. Locally, if White doesn't answer this, Black can peep here, and this is going to be bad news for White. So White could not do that yet, and White connected. Um, having filled a liberty, Black has to continue locally and place this. So as I was saying, the territory, the difference in territory, um, oh, that was four points there. So I, I was saying 18 points, but I probably meant to say 19 points. Uh, these three points I've marked here, they count as a four point difference in White's territory, because when you capture a stone, you usually count two points for that. So that's the Japanese system. And inside the black territory, that's a 15 point black territory. Um, so that's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and I'm counting this point too, which is sometimes and sometimes not black territory. It's a point where if it had been a seki, oh, it wouldn't have. So let's call that 14 points. And it's 18 points after all. So that was a bit sloppy, but yeah. I'll call it 18 points now. Um, so that was a big move as far as territories were concerned. And the important point is this cutting point that Black has created. So Black has created a cutting point. Um, at g5 and actually played the cut to that. So that's going to make a difference to what happens towards the lower side of the board. So that's why the black move here was really big. And now white is putting some pressure on the lower side. So everything else is pretty much finished. So the upper side, it looks like it's a white territory already. Um, for instance, if black tries to split this white territory, it looks like white can actually connect up. So something like this might happen. And this just looks like it's uh, not going to work for black. I don't think it's going to work for black. Um, so, so that's sort of connected up. A bit of Aji there. But in any case, it's not as big important as what's happening towards the lower side of the board. So everything else you might say... It's sort of finished up. H9. The J10 stones. The J10 stones cannot be captured. Um, but they're pretty small at this point also. So for the time being, they're connected up. Uh, so that was Stumper asking that question. Um, th for the time being, those four stones, um, these four stones in the center, they are connected up for the time being. Um, but if black threatens them, white will sacrifice them in some cases. They're definitely not as big as what's happening on the lower side of the board. So in the game, black extends once, um, playing some forcing moves. And I think he was... Um, I think the time control is one hour each. Um, I think this sequence of forcing moves Black played must have been just gaining some time. Uh, because this invasion towards the lower side, um, it was basically, uh, I think the decision seems to have been based on his opinion of the overall position. So it was a kind of a positional judgment that he had to do something or else he was going to lose. Because basically the, the safe move if Black was satisfied with how the game was uh, going on, he would have played this move, which is it's a big territory move, and it creates a living shape where Black, if White had played in the lower right corner, that Black group would not be alive. So it's an important point that Black is supposed to take immediately. Um, but he didn't do that because then White would add a stone. Uh, for instance, White would probably add a stone somewhere around here to the... Um, here or maybe even more safely at this point um, to the lower side and white would be ahead so this was basically not good enough for black black had to try something stronger so all these forcing moves that he was playing um, didn't really have to be played right now but i think he was probably just gaining some extra time to think about what he had to do so he's um He's really busy because he, at some point, Black has to move back to the lower right corner. So he's trying to settle this group on the lower side with this sequence of forcing moves. 
and then he moves back to the lower right corner, which is a move that he had to play at some point. So he's alive in the corner now, and if he can um, settle this group on the side, he's going to be okay. So white jumps here. White's trying to cut black off. Black covers here. Um, if white leaves it, black will have room to live on the side. So for instance, um, for instance, if black plays the this sequence, it's pretty much alive on the side now. So uh, this is what black is sort of aiming at. And white countered with this. I was actually um, wondering if it would be better to go straight down, which would be more effective towards the side group. It would take away Black's eye space on the side, slightly less effective towards the lower right corner, because this doesn't actually threaten to kill the white, the corner. So um, actually both of them were possible at this point. Uh, white is winning in either case. So white chose to put more pressure on the corner and then played this move uh, which was a kind of a bright red on the computer screen when people were looking at it um, with an AI. So obviously it was a bad move. Um, apparently White had a choice of this move and this move. So um, the, the variation I chose was this one. And basically the idea is that White can make a loose connection there just by jumping and attaching at five. So the, the attachment at five is the shape, and it might look like there's a potential co there, but that co would be pretty suicidal for black. So black's not about to do it. So I'm, I'm talking about this co. This would be so dangerous, it would kill the corner, basically. So black doesn't want to do that. So black's gonna be playing here in any case to live in the corner. White gets to squeeze the side group. Black will be able to survive. Um, one way to survive would be to play here, yeah. So something like this. Uh, and white will have a small lead. It's it's not um, a huge lead. The game is very close, but it's, it's probably good enough. Um, and uh, Lee had a pretty good score at this point. So um, I think China would have won the game if he'd played this way. So in this position, just looking at it this way, um, the big difference between this and the game variation is that stone that white played at the mark point um, basically meaningless. White didn't need that stone. White didn't need to play a stone there. It was a wasted move. Um, so some people were saying that he it was equivalent to a pass, which is a bit harsh, um, but it was a wasted move that it did lose the game for white. It was um, basically that one move was the losing move. Um, so it was just a bit slow. Um, and Black got to play this forcing move from the center. And in the process here, Black is alive in the corner. And Black gets to continue in the center. So um, just compared to that variation I was showing, this is hugely um, efficient for Black. So the game continued like this. Um, White did manage to escape towards the right. But you can see that basically... Um, white completely lost the opportunity to attack and it's almost like black is attacking white here. Um, black is keeping the center territory there and um, black got to play this move. Um, black is taking all the territory moves. So, so black squeezed white here, um, taking away some of white's territory there. Black got the nice territory here. That's a, a few, uh, several points, about six points territory. Uh, black got the corner on a, on a large scale. And yeah, I was saying at the beginning, Black got this territory in the center. Uh, and there was no damage anywhere that uh, Black incurred in reducing White's lower side territory. There was no damage that happened to Black. And so it was a complete victory. The local fight here was a complete victory for Black. Let's just go through some of the remaining moves. Uh, they did play it out towards most of the end game. I'll just put up the result here. Have a result. Yeah. So showing you the result, let's just go through the end game moves. Um, it was going to be about ten points before Comey. So 
Uh, since this game is six and a half points, Komi, the Korean rules, um, that means black would have won by about three and a half points. But white, um, white didn't play it that way. And when black played this sequence, um, which, you know, if you're a reasonable player, or if you're happy with how the game is, con is going, naturally you're going to put a stone in here. So yeah. So this would be the natural move. Uh, but obviously white already knows that he's losing the game. So he didn't do that. And they got into this ko. And white just refused to play the defensive move there. And in then black gets the cut. And so it's a ko there on the right side. And black plays this ko threat. White's running out of ko threats. So um, it ended as a collapse. Um, and so white resigned at this point. Um, but actually... It was going to be three and a half points or something like that. So that, that was what the real difference was. Okay, so um, finally, I'm about to finish. But I, I do have um, a game list for the first four rounds of the tournament. So let's see if I can... I uh, put that on top of the game here for a bit. Yeah, here we go. So, um, the organizers, the Korean Badu Association, so that's um, equivalent to a Go Association. Uh, so the, the Korean name for the game is Baduk. Or, yeah, that's a pretty close um, pronunciation, I think. Um, the B might be pronounced a bit more like a P, actually. So the first game was between Wong Sunjing and Shibano Toramaru, that was the Japanese player who lost the first round. So that was a win for Korea and a loss for Japan. And as I was saying, in this tournament, it's a five player for each team, five players for each team. Uh, and in the first round, this means that Black, um, I mean, Japan lost one player. So Won Sun Jing um, went on to the second round and he played Li Wei Ching, who beat him. So that was the second round. So now Japan and Korea have both lost one player. And in the third round here, Kyokagen beat Li Weiching. So all three countries have lost one uh, one player up to the third round. And then Park jun Wang he beat uh, Kyokagen in, in round four. So Japan has lost two players now. Um, there are uh, some really exciting games probably coming up. Fan ting -yu, I think he, he is actually, um, he has some, some of the Chinese titles. So... Um, He's going to be a top Chinese player, and he's going to be playing Park Jing Wang. So that's going to be a, an exciting game already. And um, although Shibano has already uh, shown up, in general, uh, we get the big names coming up later in the tournament. So there's um, going to be a total of 14 games played, um, and in each game, one player is going to be knocked out. And so we're going to have 14 games. Um, three teams of five players makes 15 players, obviously. So 14 players lose, and there's going to be one winner in the end. And so next time, I'm going to try to cap, uh, catch these games also. This week, I was sort of busy, so I'm just going to do the one game. Ah, uh, yes. And I wanted to remind everyone who's watching here, um, I wanted to remind you that... Um, I'm going to the AGA Twitch site tomorrow. So it's um, actually it's a bit earlier. I think it's about a couple of hours earlier than I started today. Um, but tomorrow morning I'm going to be, it's morning for me anyway. It's going to be evening for most of you, I suppose, depending on where you live on this planet. Um, but um, basically the same, same time of day minus two hours. Um, I'll be going to the American Twitch channel and let's see if I can find a link for it. Um, let's see. Here we are. So um, everyone who wants to see that should go to Twitch and watch me uh, talk with Chris Garlick um, about a historical game. So uh, I've just posted in the comments uh, the Twitch link for people who are interested in that. Um, and eventually that will be posted 
on the HEA um, YouTube site also. So those of you who are sort of only watching YouTube, uh, you can find it there probably in a, a couple of weeks after after the live, live broadcast. All right, uh, so that's it. And um, yes, Leonardo de Wagner is asking, does Japan have everyone, anyone left now? So yeah, it was a, it's, a, it's three teams of five players. Black, uh, Japan has lost two players. Korea's last one, China's last, last one. So they, uh, China and Korea have four players left, and Japan has three players left. We still don't know how it's going to turn out. So it's not a decisive difference at this point. Um, I don't know exactly what the schedule is going to be, um, but I'll try to catch the next one. Hopefully I'll do it um, in real time, but it sort of depends on a lot of factors. So I don't, I can't promise anything. But I will be on, on Twitch tomorrow. So anyone who's interested, uh, please watch. So thank you for watching today. And I'm finishing now. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Goodbye.